this is our last presentation of the day, and it's great to see the room this full. Uh, Toby's going to be talking about moving from closed source to open source switch basics. So, hi everyone. I'm Toby, coming from Berlin, working at uh, this company. How many of you deal with actual hardware switches like ASICs? Oh, well, that's quite a few people. How many run open source software on them? Run. <laughs> so you get packets through the pipeline in a way you get, that you define it. <laughs> so uh, the agenda, I want to narrow down the scope a little bit in the beginning and uh, then let's have a look at uh, what, what needs to be done by a networking operating system and uh, then let's have the whole 10 year uh, through the history uh, via the APIs and Gnosis, uh, what, what's out there, what is actually open source and what claims to be open source, but maybe it's not. Um, that's why this scope is as open source as possible. At least you should have an API uh, and not needing to sign any NDAs to get actually the stuff running. Uh, because most of the things are nowadays still like having an open a API, which is quite great, like a huge step in, from that point of view in terms of access to ASICs, but uh, even more re still require an NDA that you get the actual software that you can build your stuff yourself, uh, and, and that's really not what we want to have here, right? So uh, from what you need uh, in, in terms of NOS ingredients, like you need, first of all, the hardware, this is uh, like uh, the best thing, you, what you want to have, you should build it your own maybe, have the Gerber files, ha have everything to, to solder it together if you like to. And actually that's possible nowadays. Like there, there's the OCP, the Open Compute Project that uh, got handed in a lot of specifications and you can go there on their specifications website and, and can, you can download it. Like, there's, uh, uh, the OCP is, is mainly driven by Facebook, but then later Google and several other big companies jumped onto that and brought their ideas in, specifications, and uh, actually then some OEM switching vendors get, got into this as well and delivered the hardware. Like Facebook has its wedge switch, which is like fully documented there. You can get the files, you can even build it your own if you like to. Then the second part, which is like the part where I'm more or mostly talking about today, the open source software part, is actually like what do you need to actually uh, run the system? You need drivers, you need uh, uh, the APIs at least, uh, or maybe some SDKs are there. We'll see. Uh, so cutting a switch open or looking at a switch, and then you find uh, some key components on there, so like, like very boring like power supplies, fans, and, and you, ha you have some temperature sensors on that. Uh, the switching ASIC itself, some embedded system, where nowadays even the, some Intel x86 uh, CPU, which resides in there. You have a lot of ports, uh, some management networks, and, and uh, some management LEDs. Uh, you want to configure everything, and everything should work nicely together, that your switch doesn't burn. Uh, because it's getting too hot, which may happen. Uh, one other thing is like uh, that came up in the last years is, is disaggregation. It's a huge topic, sort of like in former times you had your switch driver, which was basically closed. So so each and every control plane software was basically very close coupled to that SDK. If you want to have a, like move to another hardware vendor, you would integrate this really, really specific to the other one as well. Nowadays, we want to talk more about common interfaces. We want to really see that, that we actually can use one control plane software on as many as possible hardware ASICs. And, and that's actually happening. And you even can take this, this uh, common interface and, and have it uh, in a way that uh, the control plane software runs remote. And then your NOS may contain like switch like local software that's running on, on the embedded system and your maybe centralized uh, network operating system controller that's remote. So 
where this sort of happened. Well, there was uh, SNMP at some point. Uh, some people may still use it. Um, but actually, like, more detailed APIs were starting around 2001 when a uh, working group at the IETF uh, uh, started the forces working group. This is like, was very clean design. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you know forces. Uh, two, three. So it's 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 like uh, they started with uh, some uh, informational drafts, uh, like two or three in the very beginning, and then there was a long silence, or uh, actually not 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 happening much in the public, I, I'd say. And in between, there was like uh, something uh, happening in Stanford in the U.S. Uh, uh, there was like uh, the Clean Slate program founded, uh, and uh, there were as well as several uh, researchers. Uh, thinking the internet is broken and, and we need to fix it and, and deal with uh, uh, like some things. And, and they wanted to open up uh, actually the hardware uh, because they wanted to solve the problem very, very low down there. And uh, one, one thing uh, is very nice to look at is the Ethane uh, project. Uh, it, it was a, a very, very starting point for the clean uh, slate program. Uh, there were people actually dealing with uh, uh, like 20 switches, a uh, central controller uh, kind of uh, control plane, and, and it was somehow a starting point. You, you already read it, like for OpenFlow, uh, and like with Ethane uh, and, and some uh, actually vendors out there, like Cisco. Deutsche so Telekom Labs and NEC, uh, there was Xilinx as well and, and uh, some others in, in the very beginning that supported this idea, uh, likely dropped some money as well, uh, and uh, uh, the whole Clean Slate program started and one of the major outcomes was OpenFlow, uh, which uh, you may like or not, but it was like the first sort of thing uh, that, that was trying to figure out how we can program the control plane. Uh, the data path from remote, or like you can run a controller as well on the switch if you'd like to, but the idea was to centralize everything to get actually something like a uh, use of, of the centralized knowledge to, and, and make things better. Uh, so let's have a look at, at the APIs. Uh, OpenFlow was one of the first of them. Uh, it, it actually, like, uh, sort of got off uh, in 2008 uh, then like with a paper from these researchers basically and uh, they presented at CICOM, ACM SICOM uh, the open phone enabling innovation in the campus networks because they were they came from and started in campus networks to really deal with uh, actual people running uh, uh, their traffic through this network so they got complaints and everything and they had to make it running properly <coughs> Uh, the OpenFlow 1.0 release was, was made in 2009, and then closely afterwards there was uh, a release of Indigo uh, V1, which is like uh, the OpenFlow 1.0 uh, uh, agent uh, running on the switch and uh, ma mainly dealing with the TCAMs only. TCAM is like uh, the most powerful uh, kind of hardware that can do everything sort of uh, down there, uh, but it's quite limited, so it's like maybe a couple of thousands entries if you can, you can have a bigger one if you pay more but uh, like normally you have like a couple of thousand entries maybe and <coughs> excuse me <coughs> in 2012 there was openflow 1.3 released and google announced hey we're running our network on openflow so they made it actually working for them may not be like this indigo control thing what was was running there but uh, you get the idea. They took out the whole components running on the switches. They took the control plane to the central point. They made it high available, obviously, because uh, otherwise Google couldn't run. And then uh, they presented this to the world. At least the idea, right? Uh, in 2014, uh, Broadcom released OFDP8, the Open Flow Data Plane Abstraction. It's like I think one of the things that, that sort of came out of this Google relationship. Uh, which was uh, the <coughs> based on the TTP, the uh, table type patterns in, uh, uh, that came out as well alongside uh, of the, uh, OpenFlow, uh, which you're looking at here right now. This is the 
representation of the pipeline of, of the switch ASICs here in this specific thing, it was Broadcoms, and uh, that's actually what, what was running on Google's hardware back then. They uh, got uh, rid of some bugs and, and um, I think mainly focused on layer three parts. I'm not 100% sure about that, but uh, this actually uh, is nowadays as well uh, on GitHub. You find some binaries if you, uh, that run on several switches. You uh, have the full API, uh, several header files there, and you can actually run your own OpenFlow switch with this. Come back to this later a little bit. Then in 2014, like really open source, there was SwitchDev introduced. SwitchDev is uh, actually Linux kernel's uh, hardware framework for switching ASICs. So, so you have a common infrastructure that's uh, residing in the kernel, and you have your hardware-specific driver that maps actually the uh, patterns you want to have implemented to the ASIC and the south. Sorry, Toby. You're showing F4 routing there on top of SwitchDev. Oh. Sorry. Um, basically, uh, nowadays you can run anything on top what you can run onto your Linux interfaces. So, uh, in the user space, you can run free range routing. You can run uh, manually your IP commands. Basically, what's happening here is uh, that SwitchDev exposes some interfaces, like you would create some tap interfaces, but they're, tap, uh, they're SwitchDev uh, specific. So, so everything what's happening there. Uh, is really mapped down to the ASIC. I, I, I kind of get that for something simple like an L2 bridge domain, or maybe something like IPv4 or IPv6 routing. Exactly. It's fairly straightforward. But if you get into something that's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more edge, like something like failover or HA or or um, ECMP or UCMP, does it have that degree of support yet? Uh, I think ECMP is now supported as well. Um, I think I read something with VRP, uh, these yeah, things. Uh, but ECMP in particular is, is in kernel routing for a fairly long time, so you can configure uh. routes like ECMP. I'm not uh. sure about the failover though. Uh, I, I think there's something that you can do with like IPVLAN, like VLAN devices. I'm not sure. Uh. And, like a lot of these things are actually in the kernel. The problem is. Uh just floating them, having the drivers that actually understand what you're trying to say. Uh, that, that, was yeah. so my, that was more so my question. Maybe, sorry, you should repeat the so question for the camera. But the, <laughs> is, does the switch dev have all of that kind of support to support the full richness of something like the free range route? No, yes. Uh, so, so the you listen actually to like device events. Yeah. You know, somebody so, so in that sense, like, like SwitchDev is just presenting you, uh, giving you the interface and, and uh, everything uh, what's happening up here in the user space, uh, like what, what is configured, that's part of free range routing. So you don't offload anything off free range routing down here. So there's no logic map down here, this sort of static state. There's no intelligence in that sense. Uh, unless you have maybe some thing like ECMP, then you have some hashing, some very, very basic intelligence that does like what you actually want to have. <laughs> and yeah, from the application point of view, this is like you write a Netlink mapper or something like that. It's more advanced because you actually can run like ETH ETH tool with this. So, so the actual interfaces are mapped down as well, as long as the driver supports this, obviously. I think uh, SwitchUp was around Kernel version 4.8 introduced, uh, sorry, 4.2, and sort of usable at least for like one of, one of the major uh, driver uh, or, or uh, uh, vendors that has this is Mellanox, uh, um, at least for the bigger boxes. There's as well some uh, smaller switching ASICs support from Broadcom and, and several others, but the really bigger ones are like Mellanox specific and uh, I think they're quite usable around kernel version 4.8. Uh, so, let's go ahead and, okay, half time. Um, SAI, Switch Abstraction Interface, was introduced in 2014. 
Anybody knowing this? Oh, scanning glass. Okay. Um, it's a common set of interfaces. It's as well in the Open Compute project. Uh, it was contributed by Microsoft mainly, and it's sort of where health started freezing in the last uh, couple of years because they really got open. And it, it started with 14 header files uh, as of version 0 0.9, and uh, now has 44 header files to actually like try to deliver an abstract interface that can be used to configure any ASIC below. Obviously needs some implementation. And uh, in 2018, uh, there was SAI Flex introduced. Uh, the major reason is because uh, there's around the time where flexible ASICs were becoming more and more popular because there was this company in the US uh, that drove this P4 so barefoot in the end, uh, their, their ASICs are fully programmable. So, so this, this point of view of a, of a static interface, which actually it was in the very beginning, uh, it doesn't hold with, with standards anymore. I'm, I'm really interested how this will look like in, in terms of switch dev, what we saw before, because that's like, yeah, as well quite static from at least the pipeline aspects and, and the <laughs> primitives that you can, you can call downwards to the ASIC. So uh, then in 2015, there was OpenNSL introduced. Again, it's Broadcom that's opening up some other APIs. Actually, it's, it's most mainly their SDK. It's, it's uh, sort of driven by Facebook again because they're uh, using this. Uh, uh, I'll show you later. Uh, but they're using this API heavily. It's as well where Broadcom uh, uh, the later on, so the next slides uh, delivers the SAI. Uh, but this is as well just a set of headers, very, very specific to Broadcom's ASIC. It's as well on GitHub, you find the binaries, the header files, etc., cetera, uh, and you can program the ASIC with that. Uh, now we're getting closer to today. It's 2017, and there was introduced P4 Runtime. I just mentioned there's like this whole bunch of how I can program my ASIC now, kind of thing. Actually, like like this, uh, uh, it was introduced uh, P4, and what Barefoot does uh, with their Tofinos is it was introduced a little bit earlier, because P4, uh, the programming language what you will use, is uh, like very powerful, and you can can write your complete pi pipeline in that. And <coughs> in the very beginning, there was I think a, a Thrift-based API and and some uh, other uh, tools uh, that you could use, but then a couple of years later, like in 2017, again Google came and said, like, "Wow, that's cool!" But we want to have it light, slightly different, and they presented together with them the P4 runtime. P4 runtime is not that something that actually deals only with this flexible a uh, ASICs. It's just an API. So it's, it's a little bit confusing that the P4 name is there. Uh, because that, that implies sort of you, you can deal only or deal with the flexible parts of a pipeline, but uh, actually you can actually deal with the static pipelines with this as well. You just have to model your pipeline correctly, and then you just deal with the static one. Because uh, you will hand it, uh, hand to the P4 runtime. You will hand some parts which is in the P4 info block. Uh, I'm not an expert on P4, but this is like what comes out basically of, of your P4 compiler. Uh, there's like the binary blob, what, what defines the, the, the ASIC, and there's the P4 info, which is sort of the contract between your data path and your control plane, and that's actually used in P4 runtime. And so, so if you model like your, uh, you, if you have your model correct for the static pipeline, you can use this as well on static ASICs. This. And then in 2018, last year, Broadcom uh, put SDKLT on GitHub. SDKLT is the first complete open source uh, software from Broadcom, and you can deal with their uh, Tomahawk chips. It's, it's just for the Tomahawks, but it's completely there. Everything what you need is on GitHub. It's it's like if you look at this, this is like. Really crazy what, what they thought out. They took a, little, uh, a bit of a step to bring something up that's uh, sort of comparable to the P4 because actually what you see here uh, that's coming like from your uh, 
logical tables API, there's the transaction manager and, and the logical tables itself. The logic tables in the end are something that are like preparing for a programmable Broadcom ASIC in that sense. Because like, like actually the, their ASICs are at least to some extent already programmable, but they don't give you that out yet, unless you're very, very big, I guess. <coughs> uh, but uh, the, this interface, what you see there on GitHub will, like their next SDKs will be using that interface. And they're coming up with something that's called network programming language, which is their counterpart to the P4 one. And this will define the pipeline that is used here. Almost through the APIs, because this year, this is a little bit of a look ahead, there will be Stratum. The Stratum project will announce uh, uh, or, or open source its works, uh, which is currently happening uh, in a sort of closed source, uh, closed source manner uh, on GitHub to actually harmonize everything, bring in some uh, uh, ASIC drivers, etc. Uh, like SDKLTs, there, there's currently written a, a, an adaption to that. And uh, this uh, part here, what you see in the middle, which is partly the P4 runtime you saw before, and then there's GNMI and GNOI, which is coming from the Open Config project, which was as well started from Google a couple of years ago, which defines a lot of uh, young sets and models uh, that actually uh, then define a gRPC interface that you can use to configure uh, your pipeline or, or your switch in the end. So. I think it's mid of the year, if I'm not wrong, when this will be completely open source. Anybody's like welcome to join the project. It's sort of like you contribute manpower and then you get access. So what's used anywhere here, like in terms of network operating system? And and you see, if you remember, there's something like, like you have fans, you have power supplies, et cetera, uh, that you actually want to control as well. And in 2013, so we jump a little bit back in history, like we're done with the APIs, there was Open Network Linux uh, release. And uh, <coughs> this picture is actually coming from Big Switch because they contributed that partially. And it's now in GitHub. You can build your NOS. Uh, you have your, your uh, platform extraction layers. You, you have your kernel drivers, et cetera. It's, it's everything is there. There are, I think, uh, around 14 vendors that contribute their uh, drivers and everything to the, that GitHub uh, repository that's as well in the Open Compute project. Uh, you can compile it you, and uh, you get an image that you actually can install. Uh, uh, anybody aware of Oni? I should have maybe explained it here before, but that's like the boot uh, loader sort of, it's sort of pixie that, that you uh, use to install an image to uh, the switching uh, switch itself. It's coming as well out of the Open Compute project, and uh, uh, so the image what is produced here is an Oni compa compatible image, and, and you can it run it on the listed uh, uh, when there's a switching ASICs. What you don't get there is actually the most important part, like OFDPA or uh, OpenNSL or like any library that deals with the switching silicon. You just get the framework to run your Linux on the switch. So you, it's Debian based, so you can run anything what you want. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get uh, the important part from that project itself. But as I, as I mentioned before, like uh, on the Broadcom side, there are some binaries you actually can drop there. Uh, you ha just have to make sure that the version uh, they mentioned maybe is, is correct in terms of uh, what Open uh, Network Linux uses. Plus, there's uh, like all the others, just to name two, like like Edge Core, Delta. They're having on their GitHub or uh, uh, company websites, they're having the drivers as well that you can put onto a network link. So you could actually start with something and write your own uh, controller or network control application. Then I have here two examples of remote uh, controllers like Open Daylight. It was like, I think, uh, shown here before. I'm not sure if it was today. Anyone showing anything about Open Daylight? I'm not sure. Uh, 
and uh, there was Onos uh, presentation today, um, for sure. Uh, and these tools are, are really remote controls, so you would run open network Linux on the switches to like deal with the fans, etc. And these are actually dealing with your network management. So I rush through them because I'm running late, sort of. And then there's FBOS, which I mentioned before. This is Facebook's uh, open switching system. It's on GitHub. You get the agent. It deals with an uh, OpenNSL API, so you need like OpenNSL from the one side, and FBOS is on GitHub. You can comp compile it yourself. You drop it on your Open Network Linux or whatever you want to use and run Facebook system there. It was introduced in 2015, uh, has a Thrift API, and on top of that, um, nowadays there's as well a Netlink listener, which used to be integrate, or well, there was a pull request that wanted to integrate that, but they put it outside and, and actually used a uh, Thrift API. Um, then OpenSwitch was, I think, presented uh, in the last couple of years here as well. OpenSwitch is, uh, was started from HP in 2015. HP, uh, I'm not sure what, what, the, what it was, but they uh, went away from uh, OpenSwitch, there are still sort of contributors there, but they handed it basically op over to uh, S SnapRoute and Dell, but actually lies now at the Linux Foundation. It's still developed. Uh, it has as well a Linux integration, which is in that sense just a Netlink listener. It's sort of like, again, like switch dev, but you may create uh, just like uh, tap ports. I I'm not sure I'm not familiar with that in detail, but uh, you get like 48 ports in your Linux that you can configure and uh, OpenSwitch takes care of applying this down to the ASIC. It runs on top of the SAI, what I sh you've seen before, and it, it mainly supports Dell switches right now. Sonic, that's the part where I meant as well, like when the health rose, uh, that's Microsoft's operating system. It's the software for open networking in the cloud. Uh, it runs as well on the SAI. It uh, uh, has an, a very interesting architecture. There's uh, some object libraries here that, that uh, uh, talk alongside Redis bus, uh, and uh, you have applications on top that you can choose to run or not. And, and that's uh, very interesting. I don't go into details here. Look on the GitHub page. They have a very, very huge amount of documentation. It's very interesting. 2017, sort of, you can you run any distro with switch dev again, <laughs> like uh, for Melnox ASICs in, in particular, but like Fedora 25, you could run on the switch and have a network operating system. Or like, I'm not sure if anyone knows a flat car, it was last year, uh, March, or 2018, there was a match request uh, to enable the parts that actually enable switch dev. So you have the possibility to run your container Linux on the switch and deal with the network, right? <laughs> it's, it's sort of crazy, but a very, very clean approach, actually. Uh, there, I, I just listed these two distributions, but there's actually Debian, Ubuntu, and uh, anyone else. I, I'm pretty sure uh, they have support for this as well. So you can run actually for a certain subset of all these ASICs. You can run your own software. We actually uh, do our software as well. We have a... Uh, uh, a Yocto-based system. We take parts of Open Network Linux. We started with... Uh, uh, this when Open Network Linux was not that uh, there yet, and, and we mainly did some like POCs and, and these things. But uh, actually, we're now this thing as well. Like, actually, we want to have an open source system. So, so uh, you can look on this Facebook.org site. Uh, it's currently based on the OFDPA uh, code uh, that's not open source. Uh, we have a Netlink listener as well, so you can ref run free range routing on top. Uh, you can run it integrated, you can run it remote, or you can run on us if you like uh, that way more. Just take it. We have several images there that run on uh, switches. We support a few right now, but we extend this uh, for in the next year as well. Uh, one more heads up. Uh, at the ONF Connect, there was uh, Danos uh, shown. 
it's basically an AT&T project that still uh, lies internal, has to go through some legalization, but it's uh, in principle a rewrite from scratch of uh, the Vyata people's code, uh, and the same people actually doing this, they're now at AT&T, and uh, uh, want to open source Denos this year. So this will have like a full in that sense, more telco-centric uh, applications on board, uh, but it looks very, very promising as well. So, a little bit of conclusion. There's like many ways to start things. Like, like you just have to find the right pieces. You can come to me and write me a mail. I can show you some things. Likely, it's easier than, but but it's actually. Obvious two things are there that are fully open source, which is like Broadcom never thought this 10 years ago that Broadcom will actually open source something like that for their home of chips. It's like, wow, oh, sort of crazy. And switch dev, she says, well, really, a really amazing thing. One second. And what I think is a little bit problematic is like these huge global players. So we had heard Facebook, we had Google, we heard Microsoft. They're all doing their own thing. And, uh, how would it be like if they would do something more together in that sense? But it's not happening. They even have like Open Compute Project, Open Network Foundation. There's like the organization is even separated. It's it's. I hopefully have in the next ten years as we see something happening to grow these things together. But yeah, let's see. So now questions. <laughs> yep. I mentioned SDK LT as fully open source, yes. No, no, it's fully open source, it's everything there. You can. Uh, you don't need any of these closed source parts, it's fully open source. It seems obvious to me because everything Broadcom relies on their ATMX logic. Yeah, but in this case, no. <laughs> Uh, this as well something that was really like uh, sort of shocking me as well. So it's like it's really everything's there that you need to run on a Tomahawk ASIC. Do you know if Google Linux is embracing some open source part for the ASIC management or its proprietary tools? Um, I just know rumors, so I don't want to discuss this in in detail, but. Uh, I don't think so that this will happen soon because Cumulus Linux, uh, so the question was, is Cumulus Linux embracing some parts of this? Uh, I think they're in a uh, state where they actually have a good running software, uh, so, so it's hard to, to change this, but... Uh, because it's managed by existing guys, so maybe it, that they are still resistant to... Plus, uh, uh, they have investors, so, so it may be hard to change this to a fully open source system. So it's this just guessing. Remain, it's uh, really just guessing, but uh, I would really like to see that. Yeah, we got, have we put it there? And if you have more questions for Toby, yeah. you can maybe catch him afterwards, or maybe at the uh, Magpies Cafe. Yes, <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you so much for hanging out at the SDN room today, yeah. and if you have coffee. Thank you.